Hi, my name is Patrick Sullivan and welcome to my shop. We're going to make a really great small knife today. You got a preview of it in the first video of this series, but let me show you in detail some of the neat techniques I used to make it. By the way, check out my other videos for lots more details about shaping tool steel, the do's and don'ts of heat treating, and mounting handles. This knife today is shaped a lot like an X-Acto number 11 blade. This is such a versatile shape that practically every shop has one. The Japanese have made small blades with this shape for centuries called kiridashi. Here's a kiridashi that I made for use as a marking knife alongside the much smaller blade that we will make today. The shape will function well as a general purpose carving knife, but it will come in handy for a wide variety of purposes. Some carvers use a small knife like this as their mainstay. Why not just use an X-Acto knife? X-Actos are great for cutting paper or soft materials like foam core or balsa wood. However, the blade is much too thin and flexible to be very useful for working in hard wood or for carving. The blade we will be making will be more than 25 times as stiff and will hold a much better edge. Start by buying a strip of 01 steel from one of the many online sources. The strip I used was one half inch wide and eight hundredths of an inch thick. That's five sixty fourths for you fraction lovers. Don't try to save a dollar or two by reworking some piece of mystery steel that's gathering rust in your shop. We are looking for a superb blade, not some half ass compromise. You can easily cut and shape the blade blank entirely with hand tools. This doesn't take hours, it just takes a few minutes. You can also use an abrasive cutoff blade in a rotary tool like a Dremel. A 4 inch angle grinder with a cutoff blade is also a possibility, but it's an oversized and clumsy tool for a job this small. Here's the Dremel tool at work. Refine the shape with files. If you have a disc sander or a 1 inch belt sander, you'll find they speed this work and leave very smooth edges. The blade has to be beveled. The most controlled way to do this is with a file or sandpaper on a block of wood. I did that in the previous video. For tiny blades, I don't recommend any other method. For these very small blades, a power sander will remove steel so fast that you have a very good chance of ruining the blank before you get accurate symmetric bevels. For larger blades like this one, power tools can be a time-saving option. Nevertheless, I have trouble holding them freehand on a sanding belt or a disc with sufficient accuracy. You must remove them every few seconds to cool them in water, and I find that it's surprisingly easy to return them to the spinning abrasive at a different angle each time. I've made a very handy little jig that slides in the slot of my disc sander table. It will lock a blade in your desired position relative to the sanding disc, but still allow you to move it away from the abrasive as often as you wish to cool the steel. The starting point is a small strip of wood that slides smoothly in the slot of the sander table, a runner. I then cut three strips of hardwood with beveled sides to form a sliding dovetail. Glue two of them onto the slot runner, spacing them so that the center strip is held snugly between the two outer strips. Be sure the center strip does not stick to anything. It needs to slide freely. I then glued a small square of thin plywood onto the center strip and this forms the base for my holding jig. It allows movement in two axes, back and forth across the table and in and out toward the sanding disc. On top of this base is a second square of thin plywood, which pivots on a small screw set in the center dovetail. This pivoting action allows the tool holder to be set at any desired angle to the disc. The blade holder itself is made rather simply from a dowel. First file a flat on the round surface that is about the same width as your blade tang. Drill two holes that are larger in diameter than the thickness of the blade. Remove the waste between the holes and square up the mortise with a miniature chisel, which you could have made by following my earlier videos, or small files. Saw a slot through the mortise and carry it down about one and a half inches. The exact length is not critical. Then test the fit of the blade. The dowel should hold the blade snugly, but be wide enough to allow the blade to be pivoted in the mortise. Drill a hole near the mortise and fix a screw permanently in place with CA glue.
A wing nut allows you to lock the blade in place. The mortise is wider than the blade, allowing you to adjust the angle of the blade. The combination of sliding in two dimensions, pivoting, and setting the angle that the blade is clamped provide enough flexibility to make the blade attack the sander at just about any compound angle that you want. Use a sanding disc of 150 grit or finer. The smaller your blade, the finer the grit. The goal is to slow down the sanding so that you can stay in good control. Coarse sanding discs just remove steel way too fast on these small blades. Power sanding develops a lot of heat very quickly. I like to keep the blade temperature well below 600 degrees. I don't want to see any color develop on it. If you let the steel become very hot, which may take only seconds, it will become less soft. I work hard to finish all the shaping and surface polishing while the steel is in its fully soft annealed state. Sand both sides until you've achieved smooth and symmetric bevels. Please note that the blade tapers from its back edge to its cutting edge and also from its shank to its tip. After the power sanding is done, use hand sanding to refine the tip and the edge shape. Get all the surface blemishes and scratches out. If the scratches are deep, start with 180 grit, then 220, then 320, and finally 600. If the 600 grit reveals scratches that you failed to see earlier, go back to 220 or 320 as necessary, and then repolish. We heat treat this blade the same way we've done with all the others. Heat to 1700 degrees in a propane flame, and plunge it in peanut oil until it's cool. Temper it in a kitchen oven at 400 degrees for 30 minutes, and then quench it in water. Remove the black color with 320 grit silicon carbide paper, and finish with 600 grit until it develops a little sheen. Since this blade might be used for a wide variety of cutting tasks, I decided on a handle shape that was a little more elaborate. I cut two strips of wood almost one inch wide, a little more than a quarter inch thick, and about five inches long. Route a shallow recess in both pieces to create a slot for the blade tang. I then put the two pieces of wood together with double-sided carpet tape. And laid out a design that was contoured for shallow finger grips. Cut the shape out with a coping saw, a bandsaw, a jigsaw, or a scroll saw. You can also cut the finger grips with a round rasp. Further refine the shape with rasps, sandpaper, and the judicious use of a belt sander. Be sure to taper and refine the shape of the handle where the blade emerges. Develop it to its final shape and finish now. It's very hard to do this after the blade is installed. Okay, slather on 5-minute epoxy, insert the blade, and clamp everything together. Let it sit overnight. It takes at least 12 hours to develop serious strength and two days or more to achieve its maximum strength. Be sure to wipe away epoxy squeeze out near the blade immediately. All that remains is to sand thoroughly. A strip sander used judiciously can speed up the removal of glue and uneven joint edges, but most of the sanding should be done by hand with fine sandpaper. I decided to add a rivet for extra strength. Drill a hole right through both the wood and the steel. 
use a bit of exactly the same diameter as a brass rod. Cut a short length that's just a little longer than the hole, tap it in place, and then peen both ends gently. This will widen the rivet locking it in place. File away any excess brass and sand smooth. I sand to 320 grit and then apply several coats of de-waxed shellac as a sealer. If you want a high gloss finish, buff with a gray 3M pad and then apply a coat of urethane varnish directly over the shellac once it's dry. Now let's give it a few strokes on a very fine diamond stone to finish the edge. That's it. An attractive tool that you'll use for dozens of tasks. Need something much smaller? It can be made in exactly the same way. Need more details about heat treating? The link to my video on heat treating is in the description below. I will discuss some of the issues and methods of sharpening and polishing these blades in a subsequent video. Thanks for watching.